Field. I'm Vivek Atre, and we are back with another session in Horasis, USA. And this is a very interesting Horasis initiative. We have a very diverse set of topics already, which have been discussed throughout the day. And we will be going on with a lot of topics which are going to be very interesting to you throughout this day. And 500 speakers, if I may say so, of whom four very interesting speakers are here, or five, if I may say so. And these four ladies are very, very illustrious and successful in their own right. I'm going to introduce them one by one, and then I'll give a few thoughts on the topic, and then I shall pass it on to them for the first round of their thoughts. Our first speaker is going to be Nina Angelovska. She's a PhD and an entrepreneur. She's the president of the Macedonian E-Commerce Association, assistant professor at the University of Tourism and Management, and she is also a former Minister of Finance of the Republic of North Macedonia, where she lives. She co-founded Grouper, which is a leading e-commerce platform known as the game changer of e-commerce in the country in 2011. You can find out more about her on LinkedIn, and we'll try to keep it short introduction. So I go next to Kathy Ireland. Kathy Ireland is a world-renowned entrepreneur, a philanthropist, human rights advocate and author. She's a former supermodel and she appeared in 13 consecutive Sports Illustrated swimsuit issues, including three of its covers. In 1993, she founded a brand marketing company, Kathy Island Worldwide, which licenses Global Magazine, which licensed Global Magazine recently listed at number 15 in its annual top 150 global licensors. This makes Cathy Allen Worldwide the highest ranking woman-owned licensing business in American history. Ms. Ireland's business success has earned her more Forbes magazine covers than Sports Illustrated, believe it or not. <laughs> Nina and Cathy, and uh, I, I really uh, am going to rush through the introductions before coming back to you ladies. I'm coming to Bizila Bokoko. She's based in New York. She is a United Nations award-winning entrepreneur, a global leadership speaker, diversity and inclusion expert, and on-air TV correspondent hailing from Spain with roots in Equatorial Guinea. She's the founder and CEO of BBES, a consultancy firm, as well as Bizila Wines and Cabas. Since 2009, her nonprofit organization, the Bizila Bokoko African Literacy Project, has opened libraries in Africa, and she is popularly known as BB, I believe, is notorious for international companies from local to global, which probably means that she's famous for that, and it's a tongue-in-cheek kind of way to introduce herself. And nice to meet you also, Bizila. And Katika Roy is the CEO and founder of Denver-based Pipeline, an award-winning SAS company that leverages artificial intelligence, to identify and drive economic gains through gender equity, Katika is driven by a passion to eradicate economic inequality and champions the rights of refugees, women, and children. She's an award-winning business leader with more than two decades of experience in technology, healthcare, and financial services. Ladies, I could go on introducing you, and it's fantastic to be on this panel with you all. I myself am a former civil servant, uh, an author, a speaker, an advisor, and this is probably my sixth or seventh time chairing a Horasis session. So I'm just going to introduce the topic very briefly before I pass it on to the speakers. We don't have much time. We have about 40 minutes to go. But what we're going to do is talk about diversity. And diversity, in my view, means acceptance. If you accept people who are different from you, that means you're already embracing change, embracing diversity, embracing people of all kinds and backgrounds. And the more we include people of color, women, underprivileged sections of society, perhaps, those who are not akin or alike to our communities, the more accepting we become and the more successful we become as leaders. When we empathize with others, then we become much superior to those who are narrow-minded in their approach even if they may be richer and more successful than us. And what better panel than this one? I mean, the, C, the CVs themselves introduced these ladies and these entrepreneurs, these successful business persons so much. But without further ado, I'm going to go to 
Nina Angelovska first. And I'm going to request you, Nina, to talk a little bit about yourself and a little bit about how you embraced diversity in your career. Nina, over to you for three minutes in the first round, everyone. And then I'll come back to you again. Thank you very much, Vivek. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for meeting you, the all amazing ladies. I heard you said that this is your sixth or seventh time chairing a panel, but I hope that this is the first about diversity, having an uh, all-female panel. I will thank you That's very... the second one, but anyway. Okay. <laughs> Then we, you know, we are competitive by nature. I, I guess we make this better than your previous, than your first experience. It's the best, it's the best. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so just briefly, because thank you very much for your introduction uh, for for myself. I will try to uh, briefly zip my whole, let's say, career path uh, and. Uh, maybe say a few words on diversity and I hope that we will have the chance to discuss over the uh, upcoming 40 minutes more. Uh, so I am, um, I co-founded, uh, as you said, I'm an entrepreneur by nature. I co-founded the leading e-commerce company in 2011 when there was no e-commerce in North Macedonia at that time, Macedonia, when we launched the business. And, um, you know, the, the, the situation was actually that it was not a good timing. Nobody was buying online. We are a cash system cash reliant society, businesses were not online, but we were sort of enthusiasts and we believed that we will make a change and transform e-commerce. And uh, that's actually what we did. And we are very grateful for that. Our work became recognized, everything what we did. And uh, Grouper is known as the game changer of the Macedonian e-commerce. So basically I was, my, my career path or my entrepreneurial journey happened very naturally or organically. I developed this passion for e-commerce during my studies. I graduated as the student of the year um, in the Faculty of Economics and New Business. Then later I did my master's thesis and my PhD in management at the same uh, faculty. And as I was running the business, I was learning a lot. I was learning from everyone. I was traveling a lot. I got invited to many different events across the globe to travel and get a chance to meet different entrepreneurs, male and female, of course. And to sort of see what is the, the the characteristics and the mutual things that kind of tie us, uh, and regardless of where we live and uh, which color or race or or gender we are. Uh, so in the 2018, right before I turned 30, I was recognized as Forbes 30 under 30. I sort of caught the last train, I guess. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, I was invited by the United Nations to join as a global e-trade for women advocate. So that's when I engaged a bit more deeper into the topic of quality, let's say, and got a chance to make a bigger impact, maybe. Uh, and um, in the meantime, I co-founded, as you said, the Macedonian E-Commerce Association in the drive and passion for e-commerce and thirst for change and making things better. And it was the same drive that made me make a brave decision and accept being part of the government as Minister of Finance later on. So I was, uh, I had the chance to sort of embrace the experience of the private sector, of the non-government sector and of the government sector. Um, and it was a very tough year during COVID. I was heading the public finances and I left the government in September 2009, 2020. Then I had a successful exit with my company, which was acquired by an international group. And uh, now I'm heading the association, working in consultancy, have more time to make a bigger impact in gender equality. So I'm forming a new gender equality alliance at the moment. I will speak about that briefly later. Uh, so to stick to my three minute time frame, uh, I would say that I am grateful for all the struggles and especially for making the brave decision to accept this position because although it was very hard, it sort of made me realize what is discrimination because previously I didn't have the chance to feel it that hard on my skin. I knew that we are living in a man's world, but it is uncomparable if we compare the sexism and everything that's going on in the business sector and in the, in the government uh, sector. So thanks to that, I think that I will be able to make a bigger change now after, after having felt on my skin, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, struggles and uh, pulling and pushing uh, during these years. So thank you, I'll stop for now. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. That was firstly for sticking to the time and for giving us so much information in those three minutes. And 
let me say at a very young stage of your career, you have achieved so much already. I'm mm -hmm. sure that last train was the first of many. So you'll have many flights and trains to catch. And we'll come back to you soon. We have Kathy Ireland now, and uh, it's a privilege and pleasure to be uh, in the same room uh, with all of you. And Kathy Ireland is probably the most famous person that we know of here. And Kathy, from Sports Illustrated to Forbes, that probably sums up a lot of your journey. So tell us about the journey and bring in a bit of diversity in this state. But we want to know more about you for now. Uh, well, thank you so much, Vivek and Nina. My goodness, congratulations to you. What a powerful story. And it's an honor to join all of these amazing leaders on our panel today as we talk about diversity matters and really unpacking DEI. And for our company, the acronym means diversity, quality, and inclusion. And equality, it is often desperately denied by a great systematic sickening lack of opportunity and paths for women, people of color, and indeed people of different beliefs. And we'll talk about that. And Vivek, I loved what you said about acceptance, so important. And DEI is in my DNA from childhood. Our parents taught equality. Mom's a nurse bringing healing uh, to people of every race, religion, color, socioeconomic background. Dad worked as a relations leader with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta supporting farm workers and experiencing mom and dad's commitment to equality gave courage to our family. And at age 11, Dad shows me this ad in our paper. It read, newspaper carrier wanted, are you the boy for the job? And dad knew the reaction this would get. I wrote to the paper saying, I wasn't the boy, I was the girl for the job. <clears throat> and as this scrawny preteen riding my bike up this steep hill, I noticed a man at the end of his driveway and his face is bright red. And he's yelling at me, what are you doing here? This is a boy's job, you'll never last. And I wouldn't let him see me cry, yet must admit, so grateful to him because there were days I wanted to quit. What would that do to the next girl seeking the job? And dad said, Kathy, give 110%. If the customer expects the paper on the driveway, put it on front porch. The lesson under promise, over deliver. This is foundational to our business today. And each year was named carrier of the years and so grateful that I didn't quit. And so I encourage everyone when you're facing tough stuff, please persevere. And as a girl facing discrimination, I had no idea decades later, I'd need those newspaper skills to compete at the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting newspaper toss with Warren Buffett. And the lesson we either break down or choose to break through. Nina, your story is such a, a tribute to that. And, and all of the, the leaders on this panel have that story. And I know we need to reject bias of every kind. And often we're unconsciously comfortable with people who look, act, or seem like us. And if we're in a room and everyone looks and thinks the same, bias is present and every leading business publication reports the scarcity of women in general and women of color specifically in CEO chairs. And as a Christian with a biblical worldview, scripture tells us that racism of any kind is an abomination against God. The throne of God is made up of every tongue, tribe, and nation. And I serve on the Women's CEO Roundtable for the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation. And are you shocked that over 340 million people live in extreme persecution simply for being Christian? And it's from Nigeria to Iraq. Christian persecution is at an all-time high, even in America, where this can be dangerously subtle or brutally overt. And anti-Semitism... The anti defamation League reveals over 1 billion people are anti-Semitic. And in Xinjiang, China, Uyghur Muslim human beings are being enslaved, tortured, and killed. Atrocities and genocides taking place globally, horrific. So we've got to be alert to biases, reject them, think about who we're serving, and are they represented by our decision makers? Does our company provide a path forward 
for all people of, of all backgrounds to grow and excel in our company. And establishing continuous mentorship programs, important. Everything we do consistently becomes habit. And if we don't have strategy, DEI simply won't happen. And when the corporate calendar recognizes holidays of different backgrounds and religions, people are honored. So are we seeing a resume or a whole person? And choosing not to see color, it's, it's not the solution. When we ignore discrimination, we allow it to grow. Very well said, Kathy. Very compassionate and very, uh, the bigger picture is in your mind. I can see the worldview. I can see the insight and sensitivity. We'll come back to you for more. Oh. <laughs> so now I have Bisila. And Bisila is a busy speaker. So come on, Bisila. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vivek. And I'm truly honored to be among these amazing ladies. You all have amazing backgrounds and I can only be inspired by all of you. So thank you. In my experience, I, I had diversity as part of my life since I was born because I was born in Spain, in Valencia. And my parents came like immigrants from Africa to Spain when they were very young. My mother was 13. My father was 17. Actually, my mother moved because she wanted to be a nurse. So when I heard your story, Kari, I really connect because my mother wanted to just serve. And my father became a lawyer. He was the first black lawyer who graduated of Valencia in Spain. And being the only black kid in the school was very challenging in my childhood because as a kid, you don't see color. You want to be like any other kid. And I remember one day the teacher was changing places in the school and said, um, you're going to sit here. And she sit me next to a boy and the boy start crying and said, oh, I don't want to become black like her. Please don't sit me here. So I came back home and I told my parents that they called me black in the school. The parents said, what color are you? And I look in the mirror and I said, I think brown. And they said, well, you are black. And my father told me, you have two issues. You are black and you're a woman. You're going to have to deal with this. So when you said, Vivek, that diversity is about acceptance, I have to accept my first diversity first. So I think sometimes you want people to accept you. But if you don't accept yourself first, it's very difficult to move into to navigate in this world the way it is. And of course, I experienced situations when I finished college. I went to college, I studied law and economics with the hope that I would get a great job. And then I sent a lot of resumes. It was not like now that you could Google people and see, ah, she's black. No. <laughs> Back then, it was blind. You'd write letter. And then I go to the interview and the people were like, oh, they didn't expect that. My accent in Spanish, of course, nobody could identify any African accent in there. They don't have Lou because I was born in Spain. Definitely. So I have no accent. So this was kind of the norm in my life. But I realized that diversity is all about to be invited to the party. But if they don't, you have to also invite yourself. You have to try. And that's basically what it was my life about in Spain. So I ended up being an intern for the uh, Valencian Institute of Export. That is the thing that brought me to New York, helping corporations to do business in the United States. And I ended up being the director of the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce, kind of promoting the economic relationship between Spain and the United States. And I was the first black and women in that position. And in my board of directors, there were 40 men between the age of 45 and 75. And I was 30 years old. So I knew how to navigate through that waters. And I learned myself. Eventually, I was fired after seven years. It was not because color or anything like that. I have to be honest. It was part of me. I was responsible for that. But that was, for me, the opportunity to become an entrepreneur because I realized that if I didn't want to be fired, I could not fire myself. <laughs> so but I put my own company. So this is exactly what I did to become an entrepreneur. And certainly because of my diversity and understanding the world from different perspectives, African, the European, and the U.S. vision, People are starting to ask me, how do I feel about certain issues? So that's what I started to become kind of like a consultant in issues of diversity and inclusion. And I travel basically helping corporations to understand how people could understand what is cultural intelligence, what that means, and how could people accept each other from the vulnerability. 
And it's true. We all have unconscious bias. We are designed like that because in our amygdala, everything that we see like a threat is something that is not familiar. We have a tendency to be aware about it. We, so it's part of us, but we need to educate ourselves. We need to look at each other from the place of love. And that is the only answer. So that is a beautiful way to put it. Look at each other from a place of love. And what a beautiful accent you have as well. If I can please compliment you without any inhibitions. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I mean, what you told us, the story is very touching. This is an outstanding panel already. And we have last but not the least, Katika Roy, who is very, very passionate about these issues. And especially economic inequality and champions the right of women, especially and children. So Katika, over to you to talk a little bit about yourself in this one. And later we'll come to more details in the second round. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. There we go. All right. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and um, my name is Katika Roy. I'm the CEO and founder of Pipeline. Pipeline uh, is a software platform that increases the financial performance of companies through closing the intersectional gender equity gap. So gender plus race, and ethnicity, and age. We actually started with research. We did a research study across 4,000 companies in 29 countries. And what we found was that for every 10% increase in intersectional gender equity, there's a one to 2% increase in revenue. What we also saw in the market is that 96% of CEOs are committed to equity. Unfortunately, only 22% of employees regularly see it shared and measured. So there's a 74 uh, point gap between what CEOs and companies say is important, their employer branding and the actual employee experience. That's what we close. We are augmented decision-making so much like you would use Google Maps or Waze to go from point A to point B. We do the very same thing, but for companies, people decisions. So what we do is intercept uh, five types of decisions, hiring, pay, performance, potential and promotion before they're made run them through our algorithms. And if we find any inequity, inequity, we actually make recommendations. And that, so just to kind of give you a sense of what that looks like, the average Fortune 500 company has 60,000 employees. We found that there are three key decisions that they make at each and every year, which is performance, potential, and pay. So for the average Fortune 500 company, that's 180,000 opportunities to move toward equity each and every year. That's what we make possible. A little bit about my personal background, and I think uh, probably some of the introduction that you read. Um, I'm also a first generation American. I'm the daughter of uh, an immigrant and a refugee. My father escaped from Hungary after the fall of the 1956 revolution. Um, and with my three oldest sisters, they walked across the minefield, arrived to a refugee camp in Austria. And less than two months into the they're staying in the refugee camp. President Eisenhower sent Air Force One to bring 21 Hungarian refugees to the U.S. on Christmas Day, 1956, and they were on that plane. So a lot of my commitment to equity has to do with the fact that one person in a position of power, which happened to be President Eisenhower, said that we mattered. And my goal is to take what that gift that was given to us and to drive that forward. You know what, I can sum up what the four of you said by one word, and that is, wow. I really thank you for understanding all of you. I won't, I won't give you a round of applause right now, at the end, uh, perhaps. But I'm coming back to you with a little more now of the topic itself. And we have been touching upon it. We have been talking about it. It's not all smooth sailing either. And we know that uh, the topic is diversity still matters, even if slow to enact. Now... Life is unpredictable. Life is slow. Doesn't go according to plan. And people can often be uh, obnoxious or difficult or at least obstacles or they can be um, they can be pretty much uh, uh, they can, I, I'll use a strong word so they can be really, really rascals at times. And, and we need to somehow bring in that that flavor, that touch, that empathy which is required, which will take a long time but we can try. And here we are trying to lead that opinion through this panel. And this panel is not only being watched live. This video will be shared with hundreds of thousands of people who matter later. So Nina, coming to you again, and we'll keep the same order for this round. 
Nina, the fact that you have uh, studied the topic, you have some statistics for us as well, I believe. Let's talk about diversity in your viewpoint now. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Vivek, and congrats one more time to everyone. Uh, I mean, um, amazing uh, stories and all have their own struggles and their backgrounds. We all have, of course, and uh, I think that the, the, the very... Maybe similar thing is that everybody has a story about how they were raised and how this played a great role for where we are today. And I believe that this is key for diversity as well, how we teach new generations. And if, uh, in a decade, this will still be a topic or finally we will really live in an, in an equal world. So, you know, uh, Vivek, when I was preparing a bit for, for our discussion today, I came across a lot of studies a number of, let's say, relevant studies uh, ranging from the ILO, the International Labor Organization, to Harvard and other organizations. And it's interesting that almost all studies and research that is conducted to examine the correlation between women's representation and uh, company performance or, um, uh, or business results, uh, actually all findings lead to equal Equal, um, equal knowledge that greater representation of women in leading roles in management, senior positions leads to better business performers. So uh, I have no intention, of course, to sound a hardcore feminist. Rather, I uh, see myself as an advocate for equality and diversity. But still, I will share with you the numbers who might seem a bit uh, maybe uh, feministic. So, um, but still they're relevant studies and according to real, uh, real environments. So one study, for instance, says that equal representation of men and women is one of the key indicators for effective teams. Uh, basically teams that, ha that with more women perform better because of the ability to build quality relationships that lead to greater success and progress. Equal teams, on the other hand, also perform better than teams that are predominantly led by, by men. Uh, and this is when it comes to, um, to sales and profits. So there is another study that says that a 10% increase in uh, women in key position uh, can lead to 6% increase in the market value of, uh, of the company. A third study, on the other hand, argues that more women in leadership positions and on management boards lead to more moderate risk-taking, um, which was key for COVID, as we all know, and greater efficiency. So um, it is interesting that this research that I quoted shows that profits tend to grow up to 50% representation of women, meaning equal teams, while above that, if there are more women in teams, there, is no, uh, there won't be any additional increase to additional profit growth. So basically, if we paraphrase a bit of these findings, it would practically mean that a 100% female team will have better business results than a 100% male team. So this is why I gave a disclaimer about uh, no pretension of sounding, uh, sounding feministic. So if we, if we have a team of 70% men, the profit will grow to equal representation, and then there will be no influence or difference um, if, regardless of the representation. Controversially, on the other hand, if there is greater representation of men, it means that the company is figuratively basically losing or missing better results and profits. So despite these findings, there are only 20, 24% female CEOs in Fortune 500 companies, which is lower than two years ago, 2019, when there were 32. So we somehow can seem to find the answer why if all points, if all studies, if all knowledge leads that women contribute to growth and better results, the situation on a global level is still like this. We're still discussing this. So even though... Nina, I'm going to interrupt you because we are a little short on uh, the time. And I'll come back to you again, of course, once more. Is yeah, okay? I'm just, I'm just finishing, with, and, yeah. I'm just finishing with the sentence that, you know, the, our discussion is diversity matters, even those who to enact. And we are actually trying to find answers if this is the case, is it because of lack of ambition of women? Is it because it's hard to have it all, professional and private life? Is it because we don't have quotas? Is it because of the glass ceiling and that women need to work harder and push themselves and, uh, and uh, get where men sort of get this more naturally? 
Uh, and I think that these are, these are quick key questions that we need to discuss and there's no simple answer, but it's rather a complex issue and a maze and a puzzle where everything sort of adds up to why we're here, actually. Absolutely, Nina. Absolutely, your points are valid and well accepted. Kathy, I'm going to ask you more about your leadership role and how your company embraces diversity and your own experiences. Uh, well, thank you so much, Vivek. It was... It feels like 100 years ago, back in the last century, when I worked as a model, not a lot of diversity in that industry um, at all. A, a lot of sameness, especially in the 80s and 90s. And uh, modeling wasn't my path, yet it ended up being an extraordinary education, uh, working with genius designers and uh, the world of fashion, being exposed to travel and cultures and backgrounds from everywhere. And the exclusivity of the modeling industry brought an awareness to the need for DEI. Uh, the entire time I worked in that industry, I was trying and failing at other businesses. Uh, but silly, we have things in common, not only our, our mom's nurses. Um, I was also fired only twice and um, knew that I needed to start my own business. Uh, I, I my formal education ended when I barely graduated from high school. I look at failure as education. So in that respect, I'm very well educated. Started our company back in 1993 and DEI, diversity, equality, inclusion, it's always the foundation of our company. And I was an aging pregnant model at our kitchen table, we started with a single pair of socks. When I worked in that industry, people accused me of being cheap. They'd say, why don't you buy nicer clothes, drive a better car? You know, prefer to think of it as being frugal. I was saving to invest in people, a team. I love sports and the idea of people with different strengths and backgrounds coming together for a common goal. And I, I, I love our team. They've become family and our company's won awards for inclusion. And this is meaningful as it represents freedom and liberty bestowed upon each team member. And we must look at talent, accomplishment, intellect, passion, social service, and empowering all people across a sea of equality. And uh, a final note on our company, Kathy Ireland Worldwide, we are a blend of every color, belief, gender, neutrality, and an open door to equality, regardless of age, race, religion, youngest on our, uh, on our team are teens, and the most mature will turn 100 in October. It is so boring if everyone looks like us and thinks like us. Our differences, they cause us to grow and they elevate us. If we're all thinking the same, that's not a blitz scaling business. It's a cult and our differences make for great debate. And I love that. I love people to challenge me and, and cause me to think and always grow and learn. But when it comes to what's truly important, how people are treated, we are aligned. We, uh, we began our business by conducting surprise factory inspections. How people are treated is at the forefront of every decision we make. If we want inclusion, we've got to stop thinking about it and just go out and get it. Very well said, Kathy. And I must uh, remark that the public speaking skills of this panel are also just about perfect. I mean, uh, not only the fact that you all have lived through so much and done so much and accomplished so much. And of course, uh, I, I won't talk much about myself, but I have also done a few things in life. But the fact is that the public speaking skills are so good that we are able to make a mark in these short interventions. And that's the point I want to make to Bizila. Bizila, I want to ask you, is, are things improving with all this awareness and all this talk and with all this, I mean, evangelizing and the fact that you are traveling, we are talking about it, Horasis is uh, taking this as an issue. And each of us is probably an ambassador of diversity in our own ways. Are things improving or do we have a long way to go? I think things are improving. I always like to put the optimistic glasses on. And honestly, 20 years ago when I started, it was impossible. I look at the room and everybody looked the same. Now this is changing. So I think that improvement, we should celebrate it no matter what, because we need to see from where we start. That there is room for improvement, obviously. I still believe that the issue with most corporations is that 
when I speak with the human resources or so people who is the chief diversity officer, they really are trying to train the employees to understand diversity, but I never see in the room the leadership of the company. And I realized that whenever I want to do a workshop about diversity inclusion, I liked also that the leadership is in the company because sometimes the direct, the, all the managers or the top positions, they're not in the room. So I think it's about example. You have to lead by example. So if you want to really have a diverse company, you really need to embrace diversity yourself. And I also believe that it's an inside job. It's about to personal development by yourself. If each person really train themselves to be more open and embracing diversity, things will change. Excellent on the ball. And I'm so happy with the optimistic note because that is ultimately what the world has to go towards if even if incrementally there's a very popular book nowadays by james clear and it's called atomic habits yeah basically you can't change the world overnight and it is just by doing that little bit that matters karika what are your views on this point <sighs> i i am an optimist but i am also a gender economist so i live in the numbers uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that, but the, the COVID-19, um, so we're now at the two year anniversary of when the pandemic started. And while inequity sat right under the surface uh, before the pandemic, and we were certainly making progress um, after once the pandemic hit, all those cracks under the surface actually came up. So for instance, uh, globally, equity in the workplace was set back 11 years. We're 268 years from equity in the workplace. Uh, in the United States, we actually lost, um, we were set back to 1990, 1988 levels in women's labor force participation. That's actually improved now to 1993 levels. But that's not only an issue of fairness, it's actually a massive economic opportunity. And we drained uh, over $2 trillion out of the U.S. economy just from the uh, inequity setbacks from a gender perspective. So since 1970, women have added $2 trillion to the U.S. economy through their increased labor force participation. In a matter of 11 months, we lost almost all of that progress. That doesn't mean we can't improve it. However, we do need to understand what the issues are if we're actually going to move it forward. The thing about it is, is that we live in, in like our companies in particular are inequitable by default. And what we need to do is to switch them to equity by design. And that's what we did with pipeline. And that's that. So when, when companies have pipeline, what they, what we do is provide companies with recommendations before they make a decision. So if you know, for instance, that there's a pay decision that if you actually make it, it's inequitable, we're actually switching the decision making, which, so for instance, before I started Pipeline, I, I had a large organization and I was obviously committed to equity, but I had to choose to be equitable. With recommendations and with technology, what we can actually do is put equity at the forefront of those decisions. And then if I'm choosing to, to um, not to follow a recommendation, I'm actually choosing to be inequitable. That's a very different decision-making model. And that's one of the things that we can do right now, which is to catapult our time toward equity. One of the things that I've often said is, it's not a question of if we can actually live in an equitable world, it's will we choose to. That's superbly well said, Karika, and I totally agree. And we actually have about one and a half minutes each for the last round, so that's not too bad. And I think we need to talk about the way forward because we are discussing this in early 2022 and this recording, this discussion will last and probably people might watch it in the future as well. So what is the way forward? How does the world become more all-embracing and less uh, closeted. And uh, Kathy, Kathy, perhaps you will change the order a little bit now. Kathy, over to you. Oh, thank you so much. You know, Vivek, we have so many people to to look to, to learn from. I think of Eunice Kennedy Shriver, the founder of the Special Olympics, and at a time when people who learn differently were considered less than and shut away in institutions. Ms. Shriver shined a global spotlight. 
and showed the world what these people can do. And we talk about diversity matters. Um, that's exciting. And when we're talking about women, women typically are the CEO of the family, women nurture. And when we invest in women, multitudes are blessed. And I, I love balance. And I love that seeing that in, in leading. And when women lead, lives are saved and health is improved. And we can also look back to some incredible people who have done great things. Medicine today is practiced based on the accomplishments of Florence Nightingale, Madam Curie pioneered radioactivity. Harriet Tubman, such a hero, courageously led and fought for freedom. Helena Rubinstein and Madam C.J. Walker, they were business disruptors. And Elizabeth Taylor revolutionized philanthropy. And I, I mean, I believe a lack of inclusion is a lack of wisdom. It makes good sense. And when women are empowered, they're great investors, really strong conflict mediators, extraordinary leaders. Look at these women on this panel. And when we address the, the lack of inclusion and just burst open every door based on ability, we prevent future forms of oppression from springing forward. And I believe that lack of inclusion happens because of ignorance and fear. And we cannot, we must not sit idly by and hope for inclusion. Each of us, I mean, we've talked about this. Each, each of us has been in a room where you know, too many people were similar. And that which we don't condemn, we inadvertently embrace. And so we got to answer the question, what are we doing for change? How are we making that happen? There's so many options to bring inclusion forward. And yes, of course, there's people whose hearts are filled with hate. However, I believe that even hate stems from ignorance and just pathetic desires to maintain sameness. So it's, it's holding past versus grasping that beacon of light for our future. Beautifully well said. And now we're going to follow the order that Bizila, then Katika and Nina, you'll have the last word before I have the very last word. So we go without my interruption. Busy love to you for about a minute. For me, diversity is a new way of wealth in the new economy. I think is non-negotiable. It's it's happening, and I also believe that through history, women we were apart, and now that women are together, like in this panel, and I think that I believe in women uplifting other women. We need to put the stairs for another woman come up. I think it's important that we help each other and also that invite men into the tables too, because this is a conversation that we both have to have. If you want gender equality, this is not only about women or only about men. It's about all together working from this common path that we want to follow. Well said, Karika. Uh, well, I, th I think there's a couple of things. One is that we need to move from good intentions to action. The, the option, you know, we have the opportunity to achieve equity right now across the Fortune 500. There's 90 million opportunities every single year to move toward equity. We need to move from great, you know, pledges and public commitments to actually seeing that happen in companies. I think the other piece that uh, that was commented on, which is something that we talk about, is gender equity is not a synonym for women's rights. Women are half the conversation, but men are the other half of the conversation. The idea that gender inequity only impacts women is actually not true. It doesn't vet out in the data. Gender inequity also impacts men, and it's not a zero-sum game. And so we need to uh, in ensure that we're not only including men as leaders, but also understanding that, that gender inequity impacts them too, and we're making a more equitable world, world for everybody. Superb. I'm really impressed with the discipline shown by the panel uh, always in all rounds. Nina, over to you for the very last word before me. Yes. Yeah, so I think a lot has been said. I have to agree with everyone. And I will have to add that uh, as the title of the panel says, slow to enact. I think that we are moving, but we are very slow. We really need to speed up. Your question was about what, what about the way forward? Uh, we need to do it all, do it fast. We need to empower, inspire, but maybe provide positive discrimination, uh, provide room for growth, for equal opportunities, equal pay, equal representation for women, 
Uh, we might seriously think about quotas in many other, in many fields. Although I thought that they're not the solution many years ago, I think that we just need to try with everything we have in order to live in a better, more equal world, more inclusive, that will definitely, no doubt, uh, will be a better world for, for everyone, for, both for men and for women. Superb, well said, all of you. And I must say uh, that this panel has been very outstanding. Yeah, I'll just sum up in one or two lines what we've discussed, and it's difficult, but I'll try. Uh, the thing is acceptance again. The thing is that we need to have right-thinking people. Men and women both need to be involved in decision-making. We need to have people from all color, all races, all communities, all backgrounds, all diversities involved in decision-making across academics, industry, governments, judiciary, the media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all these stakeholder organizations need to come forward. There's no point in talking at a, at a forum. And I often say the minutes are more important than the meeting and the action taken is more important than the minutes. I mean, what are we going to do one year from now or two years from now? Are we going to be talking about the same things? Or are we going to say that, yes, this was discussed and these are the particular things that actually happened on the ground? So that will be the good day for us to move forward and even better perhaps will happen after that. So I must uh, once again say that I'm so grateful to all of you for joining on behalf of Horasis, although I must uh, confess I'm also a speaker and a visitor like you. So uh, I guess there's a lot of diversity in this panel. Uh, already and uh, we are there's no sameness but yet there is unity of thought and there is positivity there is a bigger picture in the mind and we've crossed our time by about two minutes which is not too bad so I guess they'll call me as chairman again and they'll definitely call you all as panelists because you are outstanding a big round of applause for all of you and uh, really really I mean uh, fantastic to have you if you'll just stay on for one minute once the streaming stops, so we shall wind up after that. Thank you once again, all of you. You can say thank you if you like, uh, one by one. Busy luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. An honor to be here.